Hello everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel Logic Medico. Today's topic for presentation is facial palsy. Most commonly it's called Bell's palsy. So case scenario, the objectives of today's presentation. Facial nerve, facial palsy, Bell's palsy causes treatment. What exactly is the difference between these two? Now to the case scenario. 55 year gentleman admitted to the hospital due to a stroke or paralysis on the right side of his body. But in the face, you notice the following. This is face. So this is the right side for the patient. What appears like left to you, it's right side. What is right side of your body is left side. So in his face, his left eyelid is able to close completely. There is the absence of nasolabial furrow and his angle of mouth is deviated to the left side so there are so many deformity appearing on the left side Let's see what is this exactly so this can be facial palsy but is it right side or left side think about it so here the right side is unable to close his eyes is unable to use his muscle of the eyelid orbicularis oculi and uh, there is some amount of wasting of this muscle so absence of nasolabial fold so when he tries to speak or when he tries to smile, when you when you use both of your hand to pull one another, if one hand stops pulling, if this hand, if just think this is one hand, it stops pulling, the other hand will continue to pull. So the angle of the mouth is deviated to the normal side. So this side is actually normal, where he is able to close his eyes because the muscle is working. The nasolabial fold is intact because the muscle is still functional. That is a depression. Nasolabial fold means a depression between the nose and the lip nasolabial furrow is intact and the angle of the mouth is deviated to the normal side because the opposite side muscles are paralyzed so this which appears different is actually normal which appears defective but this side is actually paralysis is there. So to understand this further we have to move on to the facial nerve so facial now actually takes origin its nucleus is present in the pons so what is pons p o n s pons is a part of the brain stem pons means literally means bridge it is connecting midbrain with medulla oblongata so the three parts of the brain stem from above downwards they are midbrain pons and medulla oblongata so pons is a portion of the mid uh, portion of the brain stem wherein it connects midbrain with the medulla oblongata so this nerve takes has got this nucleus nucleus means cell bodies of the neuron situated in the pons so any damage to the pons mind you any problem in the pons any lesion tumor ischemia thrombosis of the blood vessel decreased blood supply to the pons can result in facial palsy as well the facial nerve nerve is nothing but the bundle of myelinated axons coming outside the cns cns includes the brain and the spinal cord so this nerve emerging out is nothing but the axons of these nucleus of these neurons they are coming out running downwards forwards and laterally towards the internal auditory canal you know external auditory canal wherein uh, it ends up in eardrum like that similarly a bony canal is there on the inside of the petrous part of temporal bone it's called internal auditory canal here the facial nerve will be accompanied by one more nerve it is the eighth cranial nerve and one artery labyrinthine artery both of these supplies the inner ear, 8th cranial nerve, mind you, and the artery. All the three structures are there within this internal auditory canal. Then it goes on the superior aspect of the inner ear where it bends. This is called the genome of the facial nerve. Actually, the facial nerve bends once inside the pons also, that is called the internal genome, and this bending on the outside is called as external genome. At this level, it gives off one nerve, which is a thicker nerve on the pitter part of temporal bone. It's called greater petrosan nerve. Then it emerges outwards and laterally and uh, it is related to the posterior wall of the middle ear within the posterior wall of the middle ear it gives one branch now to stapedius it says one muscle is there stapedius which anchors to the stapes one of the ossicle so it gives a branch to the stapedius then it comes towards the lateral wall of the tympanic cavity near the tympanic membrane it gives one branch this will appear like a string or a chord so it's called as corda tympani like a string of a guitar it appears because it is present in tympanic membrane, it is also called corda tympanic nerve. Then it finally comes out vertically downwards between the styloid and mastoid process. This is a styloid process and mastoid process of temporal bone. Through the stylomastoid foramen, it emerges out. Here it supplies two muscles, the trunk of the facial nerve, nerve to stylohyoid, 
now to digastric, the posterior belly of digastric. Then it enters the parotid gland. The trunk of this facial now extracranial portion is just 2 cm, 1 cm from the stylomastoid foramen to the parotid gland, another cm within the parotid gland. Parotid gland is a salivary gland. Oted means ear, by the side of ear. Para means by the side of ear, there is one salivary gland. Within this gland, the facial now enters and then splits up into two trunks. One is called temporofacial other one is called cervicofacial trunk subsequently divides into five branches ultimately temporal branch going to the scalp zygomatic branch going towards your cheek buccal branch going towards your uh, lip area marginal mandibular towards the lower jaw cervical branch towards the neck these are the five branches i repeat temporal zygomatic buccal marginal mandibular cervical if you place your hand on your face with the palm of your hand on the face then you can Think about the five fingers going in five directions temporal, zygomatic, buccal, marginal, mandibular, and cervical branch. Hope you understood this facial nerve, the course and its branches. So, here this greater petrosal nerve, what does it supply in the face? Basically, we have to understand this. So, in this phase, the greater petrosal nerve supplies the lacrimal gland and the nasal gland. That much we have to understand lacrimal gland and the nasal gland. Next, nerve to stapedius in the middle ear, it supplies step, stapedius muscle, which anchors onto the stapes. Next, cauda tympani nerve. Cauda tympani nerve supplies joints with the lingual nerve to reach the tongue. So, it supplies the taste buds in the anterior portion of the tongue, as well as it supplies submandibular ganglion via which, which controls salivary glands, submandibular and sublingual salivary glands. Ultimately, the facial nerve comes to the face and does what it has to do. It controls the muscles of facial expression by giving five branches. So, this is the distribution of facial nerve. Basically, all the similes and emojis which you use, uh, various types of similes and emojis in social networking, that is because of facial nerve or the seventh cranial nerve and the muscles in the face. Human beings are very emotional. We want to express our emotions. So, all these facial expression and emotions are controlled by facial nerve. Kindly remember that. So, if, so, you are able to close your eyes because of orbicular is okay. If that nerve is damaged, then you can't be able to close your eyes properly because orbicular ocula is paralyzed. Similarly, the cheek muscles are paralyzed, nasolabial furrow will be gone. And the angle of the mouth, the buccal branch, marginal mandibular, which is head, which keeps the muscles in place, if that is gone, the angle of the mouth will be deviated to the opposite side because this side still the muscles are functional. So, this is the explanation of the clinical symptoms. Coming to the facial palsy in detail, the etiological causes. The central causes are brain abscess, meningitis, poliomyelitis, spontane hemorrhage, spontane glioma. All these takes place in the CNS. Which part of the CNS? Pons. Correct. Because the facial nucleus is present in the pons. Then intracranial causes. Intracranial causes not within the brain but within the skull. Meningoma that is the tumor of the meninges, acoustic numero, neuroma, the tumor of the 8th cranial nerve, cholesteotoma, skin in the wrong place, is in the middle ear and compresses the, in the posterior wall of the middle ear, facial canal will be there, metastatic tumors also are the reasons for facial nerve compression. Other causes include intratemporal causes, any middle ear condition, please listen carefully, any middle ear condition, like ASOM, acute separated otitis media, chronic separated otitis media, labyrinthitis, pitrositis, facial neuroma, glomus tumor, all these conditions, mastoiditis, any complication of the middle ear can result in facial nerve compression because facial nerve is traveling across the posterior wall of the middle ear. So, the bones can get eroded or the edema of this facial canal can compress the facial nerve. And one of the most common cause is Bell's palsy. Its cause exactly is not known. It is known to be idiopathic. Uh, there can be uh, edema within the facial canal where the nerve is traveling. There can be edema within that canal. So, the nerve is being compressed. That is what is being hypothetically stated. So, any condition of the ear can cause facial nerve palsy. Middle ear, middle ear conditions especially. Extracranial cause obstetrical forceps delivery, assisted delivery where the forceps is placed over the mastoid process and the facial nerve is exposed because mastoid process is not developed in a newborn. Tumor of the parotid gland. We know that the facial nerve travels within the parotid gland. So, any tumor of the parotid gland, most commonly pleomorphic adenoma, can compress upon the facial nerve. Surgery involved in the parotid gland, traumatic injuries of the face, especially in the cheek area or the parotid area. 
then coming to the systemic illness diabetic mellitus hypothyroidism leukemia measles and systemic autoimmune disorders like systemic lupus erythematosus rheumatoid arthritis vaginal granuloma all these conditions ultimately causes edema of this facial canal a bony canal through which the facial nerve is traveling and causes compression of facial nerve resulting in bell's palsy the facial palsy so what exactly is bell's palsy the bell's palsy and facial palsy are used synonymously actually facial palsy is a broader heading under which bell's palsy is one of the reasons as we already seen in the previous slides bell's palsy is a idiopathic peripheral facial paralysis of sudden onset is termed as bell's palsy so it, it is not involved in the cns it's just outside the cns there is a facial nerve compression or paralysis so 75% of this facial paralysis is the the reason is bell's palsy etiology most often than not we don't know what is the etiology viral infection is blamed the cytomegalo rp simplex rp zoster epstein barr virus vascular causes cold emotional stress and atherosclerosis can cause decreased blood supply to the facial nerve hereditary hereditary reasons fallopian canal also called facial canal is narrow in the entire family so the entire family will be affected with facial palsy 10% of bell's palsy have got a pos positive family history and another uh, uh, reason is autoimmune disorders SLE rheumatoid arthritis and all can have bell's palsy clinical features sudden onset unable to close the eyes bell it's called bell's phenomenon an attempt to close the eye in the patient will cause the eyeball to move upwards and outwards it's called bell's phenomenon next coming to the epiphora that is watering of the eye will be there because he is unable to close the eyelid properly nasal level furrow absent accumulation of the food in the cheek dribbling of saliva noise intolerance this is because tepidus muscle is paralyzed loss of taste that is damage to the cauda tympani now because it carries taste sensation dryness of the eye and nose due to damage to the greater petrous nerve i told you it supplies lacrimal gland and nasal gland i told you to remember this clinical examination of the facial muscle to ask uh, to do various facial expression ask the person to close this eye and try to remove that eyelid ask the person to blow a candle the x ray C, uh, cbc uh, complete blood count total count differential count esr erythrocyte sedimentation peripheral blood smear blood sugar serology or other investigations to determine various other causes then coming to the topographical identification of this facial where exactly is the facial now been compressed or damaged so the principal is schimmer's test first test it compares the lacrimation in one eye with respect to other so whenever you put a filter paper just take two filter papers and put it over the fornings or the lower eyelid area medial side then wait for some time for for example 5 minutes and observe pull it out and observe how much wetting is there of the filtering paper if the wetting is adequate and on another filter paper it is small that means there is a defective lacrimation that means the facial nerve is been damaged proximal to the greater petrosal nerve so that is called a schimmer's test all these facial uh, 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 palsy people will have abnormality in the face that is so obvious but uh, where exactly is the lesion we are trying to detect now next coming to the pure tone audiometry it compares the stepidial reflexes on both the sides of the ear a series of frequency of sound waves are given to the patient with the help of an audiometer and a graph is obtained it compares right ear to the left ear so the facial nerve if it is damaged proximal to the nerve to stepidius that is in the middle ear proximal to that that means on one side the graph will be dipped while the other side it will be normal and coming to the taste taste test this is the tongue right side and left side if put various uh, take a dropper and put the various uh, solutions of salt bitter sugar like that so wherever the sensation is reduced on that side the facial nerve is damaged this is proximal to the cauda tympani nerve cauda tympani nerve carries the taste sensation from anterior to third of tongue so whichever side the patient is not able to perceive the taste that side the facial nerve is damaged in this scenario left side the facial nerve is damaged submandibular salivary flow test some patient may tell they are able to taste equally on both sides so but still we are to go ahead with the next next test that is submandibular salivary flow test in this test saliva outflow is measured from submandibular gland two polythene tubes are taken and they are put onto the sublingual papilla a papilla is there beneath the tongue that's called sublingual papilla and you observe for drops of saliva coming you can count for 1 minute also but at the end of at the end of 5 minutes you collect from both the test tubes on one side it is collected less while the other side it is adequately collected this side on the corresponding side on the left side of the patient the patient, person has got facial palsy proximal to the cauda tympani because cauda tympani also supplies submandibular ganglion and submandibular salivary gland thank you for watching my video 
and kindly subscribe for this.